The fact that the P-51 Mustang, arguably the greatest fighter of the Second World War, could almost be counted as the world's first jet fighter, not really, but bear with me, is a weird science-y fact that boggles my mind. Back in 1938, Germany was feeling a little frisky, and the British were like, maybe we should ramp up our war machine. And the United States does war machine stuff really well. It's like our, our favorite thing to do. So the Brits set up this purchasing agreement with North American Aviation to, to buy planes and shit, right? And they're like, hey, we really like the P-40 Warhawk that Curtis builds. Could you get a license from Curtis to build the P-40 Warhawk for us. And North America was like, how about this? We will build you a better fighter plane with the same Allison engine as the P-40 Warhawk in less time than it would take us to set up the assembly lines to build Curtis's P-40 Warhawk. And that's what they went and did. Although with any new technology as the P-51 very much was, it had some growing pains. It went through a few versions before the most recognizable P-51D took to the sky. The most notable visual improvement was going from the Ridgeback design of the earlier models to the bubble cockpit design of the P-51D. And surprisingly enough, the bubble cockpit was actually a reduction in performance. It caused more drag and slowed the plane down more, but the increased visibility for pilots in a dogfight was worth the trade-off. And the most notable performance improvement was, ironically enough, getting rid of the Allison V-1710 that the plane was designed around and replacing it with the British's own legendary Rolls-Royce Merlin. The Merlin was the same engine that powered the iconic RAF Spitfire. This was a liquid and oil-cooled V-12 piston engine, similar mechanically to what's in your car, just with probably quite a few more cylinders and a lot more horsepower. They are things of beauty, and they differed significantly from the other popular aircraft engines of the time, which were air-cooled radials. Radials are the airplane engine you think of when you think airplane engine, or the, the big round ones where all of the cylinders are configured in a circular shape. Then they have cooling fins on them, and they're cooled by air flowing over them, similar to a motorcycle engine or a lawnmower engine. And that's why they're configured in a circle rather than in lines or Vs like a traditional engine, because that's where all the air is coming from, and airplane engines generate a lot of heat, so they need as much air as they can get. And those have a lot of advantages. They're far simpler. You don't have water pumps. You don't have water jackets, cooling systems, thermostats, piping, none of that. They're also lighter because they don't have all the extra parts and 20 to 30 gallons of coolant to lug around. And lighter is always better on an airplane. Less weight makes it easier to argue with gravity, apparently. But they have some disadvantages. Because they don't cool as efficiently, you can't get as much horsepower out of the same displacement. A liquid-cooled motor carries the heat away faster, which means you can burn more fuel without burning the whole motor down. And because you don't have to have this gigantic fucking dinner plate of an engine with wind whipping through it to keep it cool, you can configure the cylinders in a long sleek design and then cover them with aluminum and suddenly it's a lot more aerodynamic of an airplane. But you still end up needing air flowing over a radiator somewhere at some point to cool that coolant down. And that's what that big iconic duct is for under the belly of the P-51. There's a radiator and an oil cooler in there that helps keep that engine cold. But if you're putting cylinders in a line to help make the airplane more aerodynamic and then you go stick this gigantic gaping protrusion under the bottom that's not very aerodynamic, it kind of sort of defeats the purpose, right? Well, don't worry, I am finally about to land my plane, pun very very much intended because this is where we get to the incredibly cool science. The engineers all the way back in the 30s looked at that big protrusion and they're like, you know what, I think we can make this cooling system a a supplemental jet engine for all practical purposes. See, the basic principle of a jet engine is it sucks in air and heats it up, usually by compressing it, and then when that air heats up, it expands, and as it expands, it's forced out the back of the jet, producing thrust. And because that big Rolls-Royce power in that Mustang produces a lot of heat that it's getting rid of through the oil cooler and the radiators in that duct, they could use something called the Meredith effect, I'm pretty sure that's how it's said, to create thrust. So they figured out that they scooped up a bunch of air and heated it up by running it over those big coolers and then had it exit through precisely designed flaps, it could produce between two and 400 pounds of additional thrust to power the plane. Now that's not a lot of thrust, like for comparison, the Cirrus Vision Jet, which is a modern small single engine jet plane, uh, produces about 1,800 pounds of thrust. But the two to 400 pounds of thrust from the Meredith effect on the P-51 was enough to compensate for, if not sometimes exceed, the amount of aerodynamic drag it caused just by hanging out down there. And I'm a huge aviation buff, especially World War II, and I just learned about this the other day, which is why I'm sharing it with you, because I think it's just super fucking cool. So I'm sorry if you don't think it's cool and I just wasted however many minutes of your time this turned out to be, but the fact that the troubles with the protrusions taming, the temperatures on the Tuskegee Red Tails was thoroughly thwarted with thoughtful thrust, well, that is pretty mind-boggling.